So let us begin uh, where we left off last time. Uh, you recall that we were looking at this toy model of n coin tosses and just to recall to you uh, n coins and then you had uh, h heads, t tails and the probability of getting h heads was given by uh, n c h. 1 over 2 to the n for a fair coin otherwise it was something like p to the power h q to the power n minus h p equal to probability of h q is equal to probability of t. So this was the expression we had the last time and we also discovered that the generating function f of x which by the way is a function of n also because it is for a fixed number of coins. This was equal to p x plus q to the power n and it followed immediately that h was equal to n p delta h was equal to square root of n p q. These are standard properties of the binomial distribution. Now what we would like to do now is to ask what does this distribution look like, what does this thing look like and in particular what dominates for very large values of n. We would expect that as n increases you are going to get a distribution which gets more and more sharply peaked about the mean value and make it less and less probable for large deviations to occur. This is what one would expect. If you toss two coins there is quite a chance that you are going to get both heads or both tails quarter in each case and then a probability half that you are going to get one head and one tail. On the other hand if you toss a 100 coins the probability that you are going to get all 100 tails or all 100 heads is 1 over 2 to the 100 which is extremely small. On the other hand the probability that you are going to get say approximately 50 heads and 50 tails is overwhelmingly high. The question is how overwhelming is this? How peaked is this distribution going to be and if I plot this uh, if I plot uh, the probability of uh, p of h versus h, you start with 0 here and of course you could have n, you get a histogram and the idea is that as, uh, as you get this is approximately n over 2 for even values of n, n over 2 is a possibility. Uh, this is going to be very sharply peaked and then you are going to get something which comes down uh, fairly rapidly till it becomes extremely small here. What I would like to show is that this is exponentially smaller than this peak here as n increases and for this we need to have an approximation for the binomial coefficient nch because this uh, thing here uh, p of h equal to n factorial over h factorial n minus h factorial and then p to the h q to the n minus h and we would like to find out what does this number do as uh, n becomes very very large. We need an approximation for this. Um, well many approximations exist but the point the best one of them the one that is practically a formula is the following. If you took your pocket calculators which have uh, the possibility of showing you numbers up to 10 to the power 99 and you press this factorial button what happens? 
where does it stop? Pardon me? Around 69. So, 70 factorial shows you an error. This means you cannot compute even a small, the factorial of a reasonably small number like 70. It is already greater than 10 to the power 99. So, the factorial increases extremely large, uh, extremely rapidly and the question is how fast does it increase? How do you make an approximation? So, what is, uh, what is n factorial for very large and the answer is provided by a formula called Stirling's formula or Stirling's approximation. It is an extremely good formula and this is where what it does. It provides an asymptotic expansion for n factorial in terms of quantities which you can calculate quite easily and of course, one would like to know what the leading term is. It is clear n factorial by its very definition is n times n minus 1, n minus 2, etcetera. So, if you took out a factor n from each of them, and you wrote n factorial equal to n times n minus 1, n minus 2, not up to 3, 2, 1, and you wrote this as n to the power n times 1 minus 1 over n, 1 minus 2 over n, dot, dot, dot. Then it is clear that in the leading approximation, if n is very large, if you left out these terms, then it would go like n to the n. But of course, as you go get closer to 3, 2, 1, etcetera, you are leaving out terms like the last term is going to be 1 minus n minus 1 over n, and it is not fair to leave out n minus 1 over n relative to 1, of course. So, this is an overestimate, n to the power n is an overestimate, and you have to compensate for it. And the form of this suggests what the compensation is, and in fact, this thing turns out to be n to the power n e to the minus n. So, there is a compensating factor. This grows extremely fast. It grows like e to the n log n. This decays like e to the minus n. Of course, this dominates over that, but still there is a substantial shrinkage here in this. And then it is multiplied by 2 pi n. Okay. That is a very, very small factor. If you took a log in the log scale, you can see this better log n factorial is dominant term is n log n and then you subtract n and then you add half log 2 pi n. So, there is a correction of order 2 pi n. The actual formula itself goes like this. It is 1 plus 1 over, now I have forgotten what this factor out here is. Uh, it is 1 over 12 n plus 1 over uh, 300 and something or the other n squared plus etcetera. I am not too sure about this fact, factor. I can work it out, but uh, this is what it actually looks like. It is a big, it is an infinite series, it is an asymptotic series, and you can see that there is the first correction here. If n is of order 100, it is already only 0.1 percent, one part in a thousand. So, you can immediately see that this is an extremely good formula, very good formula, and it gets better and better as n increases. What is the smallest value of n for which we could try to apply this? Well, if you want 10 percent accuracy or 92 percent accuracy, you could leave this out because 1 twelfth it is going to be correct to 92 percent. If you put n equal to 1 in this formula, it is already going to be extremely good. So, let us do that just for fun. If n equal to 1, then the question is, is 1 factorial equal to 1 to the power 1 e to the minus 1 square root of 2 pi. So, the question you are asking is e approximately equal to square root of 2 pi and it is so correct to 92 percent. So, even at 1, this is pretty good. At 10, it gets better, we get a 1 percent error. At 100, you get 0.1 percent error, and at 10 to the 24, you can forget about this. You can completely forget about it. So, Stirling's formula is very, very good, even for mediocre values of n. And of course, it becomes truly large, then you can completely forget about it. 
that is the reason why a lot of formulas in statistical mechanics will work because of the power of this factorial. The, the fact that this thing here is an extremely good approximation to n factorial. So good that for most of practical purposes I take the log of this I can forget about this after all for a million log a million n base 2 is base 10 is only 6 we can just ignore it it is a very very slowly growing function and the rest of it is completely negligible. So you could in fact write n factorial is approximately n to the n e to the minus n and even leave it at this. By the way how do you get this formula where do you get this from where do you get this formula from remember we are on our imaginary desert island and we have forgotten Stirling's formula we would like to derive this formula it is a good thing to know how to derive this let me digress to do this because there are other formulas which you can find by a similar trick and it goes like this. So I start by saying n factorial is defined as 0 to infinity dx e to the minus x x to the power n where n equal to 1 2 3 etc. Certainly true. By definition, this is true. This integral is equal to n factorial trivially. Now, if I put n equal to zero here in this formula, you still get one on this side. So, in fact, this formula could be used to define zero factorial as one. Otherwise, you don't know what how to define zero factorial, but I define it as one because of this. Incidentally, as you know, the gamma function interpolates between the integers and provides a fu function of which the factorial is a special case for positive integer values non negative integer values. But now if I took this and I wanted to know what does this do for very large n then you see the argument goes like this uh, if I plot this integrand e to the minus x is a function that comes down in this fashion a function of x this is uh, e to the minus x on the other hand x to the power n is a function which increases rapidly in this form. The, this is finite here this is 1 therefore the product is 0 at the origin and it goes down exponentially fast because this dominates for very large values of x and you have one very large increasing factor and a very large decreasing factor when you multiply the two the answer is that at both ends this function is going to essentially be 0 and in the middle there is going to be a maximum of some kind. So this product is going to look like this in this fashion and as n increases this is going to get steeper and steeper. So let us do the following let us write e to the minus x x to the power n is e to the n log x plus n log x write it in this form and that is equal to e to the minus x minus n log x and let us take this function let us put f of x is equal to x minus n log x and ask what does it do where does it have a maximum I expand this function and what would it do as a function of x and this is equal to where is where does its derivative vanish by the way where does it have an extremum x equal to x equal to n x equal to n because this derivative is 1 minus n over x and you put that equal to 0 you get x equal to n. So let us expand it and at x equal to n it is n minus n log n plus so f of x is that f prime of x equal to 1 minus n over x f double prime of x equal to n over x squared and so on. So the first term proportional to x minus n is going to be 0 because the derivative vanishes at that point since the derivative is exactly 0 at x equal to n and the next term is x minus n the whole squared over 2 factorial multiplied by this f double prime at x equal to n and that is equal to 1 over n. So let us put that into this integral and this becomes equal to integral 0 to infinity dx e to the power minus n minus n log n oh that that whole factor is just a constant so let us take this whole thing out it is n to the n e to the minus n integral 0 to infinity 
dx e to the power minus x minus n the whole square over 2 n. So, times corrections you can pull those corrections down and write this as 1 plus dot 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 I leave that to you as an exercise to find the next correction to this whole thing. Now this function here x is like a Gaussian peaked at x equal to n and as n becomes larger and larger this guy here sitting in the denominator becomes larger and larger and become peak becomes sharper and sharper and therefore for very large n you could actually approximate this integral which looks like this the function looks like this you could extend the range of integration from minus infinity to infinity and make exponentially small errors. So the next step this becomes equal to n to the n e to the minus n integral minus infinity to infinity dx e to the minus x minus n whole square over 2 n times times 1 plus corrections this is a Gaussian integral and I can shift this the center of this integration I can shift variables to x equal to n because it is running from minus infinity to infinity. So this integral is the same as e to the minus x squared over this that is a standard Gaussian integral e to the minus a x squared minus infinity to infinity is square root of pi over a it is a Gaussian integral. So therefore this is equal to n to the n e to the minus n square root of 2 pi n into 1 plus corrections this is order 1 over n actually that is non trivial to show but I leave you to show this that is Stirling's formula. What I have used here is the form of the Gaussian integral the simple basic Gaussian integral and I have assumed that and then of course the rest follows. So this is going to be used over and over again in statistical physics this uh, formula Stirling's formula for the log of the factorial of a very large number in that form. Incidentally we use the Gaussian integral here um, you, are you know how to derive that when I use yes everyone knows this what do you do square the integral and go to polar coordinates it is a brilliant trick it is a brilliant trick to square the integral because one would not think of that one would think of integration by parts then you get a linear relation of some kind but this is square into it this is a non trivial trick it takes a non trivial person to find it Poisson found this in 1815 or something like that so this is long long ago. Okay, so much for Stirling's formula and if you use that then I leave you to figure out the rest of this distribution to show that that if you plot h versus p of h then indeed when n becomes extremely large this distribution goes sharper and sharper and does something like this it is almost a continuum because n is very large and h is goes to takes on very large values then the discrete nature of the integer h is becomes irrelevant and it starts approximating more and more a distribution which looks like this goes up and comes down okay and is very very sharply peaked. We will do this at a later stage we will start with the binomial distribution and I will show you that a binomial distribution goes over into what is called a Poisson distribution which then the deviation from the mean goes over into a Gaussian distribution okay. Incidentally uh, we could do this right away we could do this right away because and let us do this in a physical context instead of P of H I ask the following question I have a gas in a container of volume V. So let us take an ideal gas in a container of volume V and the gas has a large number of particles n and of course the particles are moving about inside here it is at fixed temperature everything is constant then I could ask what is the probability that if I took a small sub volume V what is the probability that I have a number n of particles inside this sub volume V if I took an instantaneous snapshot of all the molecules in this room froze them and just looked at them then what is the probability that the number of particles inside the sub volume is little n okay and that as you will see is a binomial distribution because I want the probability that inside the volume V I have n particles 
probability that V contains n particles. Hmm? What is this equal to? Well, what is the probability that a given particle is inside the sub volume V? And these are assumed to be uniformly distributed, they are equally likely to be anywhere. So, the probability that a single given particle is inside the sub volume V is in fact V over V. And you are assuming that all the particles are moving independently of each other, therefore, the probability that there are n of them inside is indeed this. But that is not enough, the rest must be outside. So, they cannot be inside because I want the probability that you have exactly n particles inside. So, the other particles must be failures, they must be tails instead of heads. So, that is equal to 1 minus V over V to the power n minus n. And of course, it does not matter which of the particles is inside, you are not asking that question, and therefore, there is n c n here, and that is precisely the binomial distribution once again with little p replaced by capital V over V. And of course, we could get rid of this a little bit because I would like to see what happens to this for very large n. So, let us put let rho equal to n over V the number of particles per unit volume in this huge gas and that is some constant it is given to you since capital N and capital V are both constants it is some fixed thing therefore, this is equal to N C N and I could write this as rho uh, rho V over N. So, this says 1 over V equal to rho over N and I am going to use that here inside uh, 1 minus rho V over N to the power N minus N there we are and that is a binomial distribution. Pardon me? How did we get this? Well, if a given particle is equally likely to be anywhere in this entire volume then the probability that it is inside this sub volume is just the fraction of this sub volume to the total volume right. This is not a trivial statement but it is sort of intuitively obvious proving this rigorously is a little harder you need some notions of geometric probability we have to talk about measures and so on which you do not want to do. But other things being equal if it is likely to be anywhere as likely to be in one part of the volume as in any other then I would say the probability a priori probability that it is inside here. For example, I divide this room into halves two halves the probability that is in the left or right is half and the reason is it is the ratio of the sub volume to the total volume. Yeah. Already there are some particles in one of the half. Yeah. Yeah. We are now talking about yeah we are, we are ignoring all these things we are ignoring interactions we are ignoring we are simply saying it is an ideal gas there are these points dots everywhere I take a snapshot an instantaneous snapshot and ask I count how many of them are there at some instant of time. Of course, it will change from instant to instant it will fluctuate very rapidly but at some fixed instant of time what is the number probability that there are exactly n of them inside here. And little n can go all the way from 0 up to capital N. So, that is the sample space for this random variable. The random variable here is little n, and I am talking about its probability distribution, and that is a binomial distribution here. Everything else is supposed to be given, and you are given this guy here. And now I would like to know what happens to this as capital N tends to infinity and capital V tends to infinity, but keeping the density fixed that is important I should keep the density fixed and density is an intensive quantity okay. Then this becomes P of n becomes as n tends to infinity n c n. So, n c n is n factorial over n factor little n factorial n minus n factorial and we start putting the approximation here. So, this is n to the power n 
e to the minus n if you like square root of 2 pi n divided by little n factorial you cannot do a sterling for that because little n could go all the way from 0 to infinity but capital N minus N so one could do that one could write capital N minus N to the power N minus N e to the power minus N plus N uh, root 2 pi N minus N these are irrelevant factors we put them in any way and then rho V over N to the power sorry there is an N here to the power N here and then 1 minus rho v over n to the power n minus n and now do a sterling do simplify this simplify this expression here I leave that to you as an exercise and this thing here will finally go over to p of n goes over into e to the minus n that you can already see that emerging from here uh, sorry no this e to the minus n will cancel it will go to the following so let me write the answer down and then we will justify it e to the minus n bar n bar to the power n over n factorial where n is 0 1 2 ad infinitum because capital N has gone off to infinity and n bar equal to rho v. So I leave you to do the rest of the algebra and show that it reduces to this expression here. What is this expression called? It is called the Poisson distribution. Hmm? N bar and what is the physical significance of N bar? Well it is the average number density multiplied by the volume the sub volume therefore it is the average number of particles inside the sub volume. The Poisson distribution is characterized by one parameter namely the average value itself indeed it looks like this and now little n has sample space running from 0 to infinity because it is an infinite volume but with fixed density. pardon me yeah so what you have to do yeah no 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 little n sample space goes from 0 to infinity okay now what you have to do is carefully use Stirling's approximation these factors that is why I did not do anything here I left this term here so this thing is rigorously true in the limit when capital N goes to infinity and you must do the algebra carefully and make sure you do not make an invalid approximation of the kind you are talking about huh? and then this is indeed the formula that emerges I want you to do this exercise okay. and of course in that in that formula capital V will not appear anymore and capital N will not appear anymore because they have both gone off to infinity the ratio is taken to be a number rho some fixed number by the way this is called the thermodynamic limit of a statistical system when you let the number of particles go to infinity the volume go to infinity such that the density is finite. and statistical mechanics will reduce to thermodynamics in the thermodynamic limit this is when fluctuations disappear completely and there is a reason why we are going to pay a little more attention to this the Poisson distribution is going to appear also in statistics very often and I wanted to appreciate some properties of the Poisson distribution right away so let us do that Ah, we have now assumed that these guys are all very plain ordinary particles no quantum statistics no indistinguishability none of those complications we have not assumed any of that. This thing here this distribution is the distribution of density fluctuations in the gas in this room in a classical ideal gas. So it is telling you that the density locally the number density changes it fluctuates and it tells you what is the distribution in this simple situation no correlations no complicated interactions nothing has been assumed just a couple of quick words about the Poisson distribution
for a random variable n which runs from 0 to 1 to positive integers the Poisson distribution is given by p of n is given by e to the minus n bar n bar to the n let me use another symbol e to the minus lambda lambda to the power n over n factorial lambda is the average value of n and that is not hard to show this. Uh, p of n summed from n equal to 0 to infinity is equal to 1 because sigma lambda to the n over n factorial is e to the plus lambda and that cancels this here. It is very easy to show that the average value is equal to n, n there and this lambda here and what is the generating function f of x equal to summation n equal to 0 to infinity p of n x to the power n what does this work out to well this just multiplies this and becomes lambda x to the n and then it is e to the plus lambda x so it is easy to see that it is e to the lambda times x minus 1. f of 1 is indeed equal to 1 for conservation of the total probability f prime at x equal to 1 is lambda what is the variance what is the variance in this case it is lambda itself so the Poisson distribution has this interesting property that the variance is equal to the mean therefore the relative fluctuation which is a standard deviation divided by the mean is 1 over the square root of the mean so you see yesterday we saw this 1 over square root of n appearing in the denominator and that is characteristic of these distribution the such distributions these are all uncorrelated and that is the reason why this is happening so it is a very interesting property of the Poisson distribution that the variance is equal to the mean what is the generalization of the variance and what is the idea behind the variance in any case since we are doing statistical mechanics we are going to know a little bit of statistics what is the idea behind the variance of a random variable you see if you have a variable that goes up and down in this fashion it fluctuates about some mean value then of course uh, you would like to know what is the strength of these fluctuations but then if you add them up you might get you will get 0 because the guys on top will cancel the guys below so what you do is to square it first and make the thing non negative and then take the average value and take its square root and that is the standard deviation that will tell you the size of the fluctuations relative to the mean. So that is the idea behind the variance and of course you would like to make this a little more general and go to higher orders and so on for instance if you look at the third moment then there are pieces of the third moment which come about because of the second moment in some sense just as there are pieces in this mean square value you remove so what I do is remove this I remove this thing so this is also equal to n squared minus n whole squared and then I get an idea of the true fluctuations in exactly the same way for the third moment you remove pieces which come from the lower moments for the fourth moment you remove pieces which come from the first three moments and so on and so forth those are called cumulants they call the cumulants of the distribution and one of the most interesting properties of the Poisson distribution is that all the higher moments or all the higher cumulants are equal to the mean that is it so just a single parameter distribution in the case of the Gaussian the third and higher cumulants vanish identically you have just the first two cumulants you have the mean and the variance and that is how a Gaussian is defined in terms of the mean and the variance we will come back to these things a little later the point I want to make right now is that if you took this thing here and let n bar become very large then this Poisson distribution which has a shape of this kind it is a it is a histogram actually p of n it has some probability that n is 0 some probability that n is 1 etc etc and then it peaks at some value and comes down sort of exponentially it comes down in this fashion 
Now if you let an n bar is approximately somewhere in the middle if you let n bar itself become very large so this whole thing shifts then the deviation from the mean about this point here starts looking like this and takes on a Gaussian shape. So you can actually go from the variable n to the variable n minus n bar and call that a continuous variable if n bar is very large if it is of the order of 25 million then plus or minus 1 does not matter it is practically a continuous variable and then it turns out and this again uses Stirling's formula that from this formula you can get an expression for the probability density of a variable x which is n minus n bar the deviation from the mean of a Poisson variable and this will take on an expression which looks like e to the minus x squared over 2 sigma squared over a normalization factor it will start looking Gaussian. So this is how in this simple instance the distributions change from one shape to another you start with a binomial distribution of Bernoulli trials and then from that you take the number of particles number of trials to be very large and you take the probability of success in a trial to be vanishingly small that was my limit n over v because remember p was equal to v over v and n was the number of trials so I start with like tossing a coin it is exactly like that the probability of success in a trial the probability of being in the sub volume is going to 0 because capital V is tending to infinity the number of trials the number of particles is increasing such that the product of these two guys is finite and that is my rho times little v then a Bernoulli trial goes over into Bernoulli uh, binomial distribution goes over into a Poisson distribution then if the mean value of the Poisson distribution is very very large compared to unity the deviation from the mean is approximately a continuous variable that has a Gaussian shape goes over into a Gaussian shape. So this is how the Gaussian appears in these problems where you start with integers and then eventually it ends up with Gaussian distributions. There are other fancy ways of saying this it invokes what is called the central limit theorem but we will not do that right now we will continue with what we are doing but I want you to appreciate this fact that a probability distribution can move into another probability distribution shifts over okay. Now with this preliminary let us get down to where we had ended the last time so we go back to our problem in statistical mechanics of an isolated system in thermal equilibrium and I pointed out that we have a postulate now and we are going to use this fundamental postulate of equal a priori probabilities to see where we can get. I already told you what kind of system we have we have a huge system with a total number of particles capital N let me call it N total for a reason which will become clear the volume of this system is V total and the energy of the system is E total. Right now I do not want to give other attributes to the system I am simply saying it is some collection of particles may be interacting with each other classically and you have these parameters given to you and it is an isolated system in thermal equilibrium. So all its microstates are equally probable and it has a large number of microstates omega total this is the number of accessible microstates. of this huge system okay. the probability of uh, system being at any instant of time in any one of the microstates is 1 over this omega total that is the assumption that is gone in not derivable from mechanics it is gone in. Now I ask suppose I come along and for reasons which will become clear I imagine that this is system is really made up of two subsystems so let me call this total system subsystem A and subsystem B it is really made up of these two subsystems imagine an imaginary partition in the middle of this huge container if you like and this is really made up of two subsystems each of them is a very large system okay and they are evidently in equilibrium with each other because they are isolated from the rest of the universe 
Now the energy of this let us say n, v and e are the corresponding parameters for this subsystem and on this side you have n prime, v prime and e prime for that system and you have trivial relations which says n plus n prime equal to n total, v plus v prime is v total, e plus e prime is e total. E plus e prime is not quite e total because now you should say look if these particles are interacting with each other then and this is very subtle that is where everything is buried like in all these things e plus e prime is not necessarily e total because I cannot define e, I cannot define e. Even if you had one particle on this side and one particle on this side and they were interacting with each other I cannot define e and e prime why is that? Yeah, because there could be a potential energy. The kinetic energies of each particle are quite unique, but the potential energy is a common property and depends on the coordinates of both particles. So if I have two particles, charged particles, I can tell you the total energy of the system. I can tell you the kinetic energy of particle 1, the kinetic energy of particle 2, but I cannot tell you that one third of the potential energy belongs to this particle, two thirds belongs to that. I cannot tell you that. So you cannot do this apportioning. So there is that problem but now I am going to argue that let us assume that the interactions are reasonably short ranged. Hmm. Let us further assume that if you have a particle here and here near the boundary then definitely there is a potential energy of interaction between these two guys and there is exchange of energy between the two systems. At some instant of time this side may have more energy, more particles, the other side may have less energy, fewer particles and so on. This is possible. So there are rapid fluctuations on both sides. The totals are kept constant. However, if this is the number of particles here and it is very, very large and imagine really putting a take a three dimensional volume and put a partition here, some kind of screen or mesh or whatever. What do you think is the number of degrees of freedom which are actually interacting on either side? If you have a volume with n particles, then on a wall how many of these particles would be close to the wall? I have 10 to the 24 particles in this room, how many of them do you think are close to the walls of this room at any instant of time? Of the order of? 1 over n? No, no, what do you think is the answer? I have capital and 10 to the 24 particles in this room, how many are on, uh, how many of them do you think are close to the walls at any instant of the time? N to the power? N to the power 2 thirds because that is the surface to volume, N to the 2 thirds. So 10 to the 24 at any given instant of time, 10 to the 16 of them are close to the walls of the order of. Therefore this ratio of surface to volume is 1 over 10 to the 8 and is negligible. In exactly the same way at any instant of time the number of degrees of freedom that are in interaction across this partition is of the order of n to the two thirds and I am going to neglect that compared to capital N itself. That is the level at which the fluctuations are and as capital N becomes larger and larger remember we are really talking about astronomically large systems here in the numbers of particles and that is why uh, this is completely negligible. I am therefore going to say that I can to a good approximation partition the total energy into E and E prime. So without to a very good approximation certainly going to write that. Then I ask the following question at any instant of time what is the probability that the energy of A is equal to E. So P of E equal to probability that A energy. Now what is this equal to? Given no other information, given just this, what is the probability that this is going to happen? And I argue that this is equal to
it is equal to the probability, it is equal to the number of microstates of this entire system such that A has energy E. You see once I write down the energy of each particle, write down a microstate, I know everything about the system. So now exactly the same argument as little v over capital V, all microstates are equally probable. Therefore all I have to do is to count that fraction of microstates for which of the total system such that the subsystem A has an energy E. So this is equal to omega, the total number of microstates of the system omega total such that A has energy E. This is divided by and of course the rest such that A has E and the rest of them have E prime. So let us use the symbol subscript total for the total system, no subscript for the subsystem A and a prime for the subsystem B that is my notation. So this is omega of E, this tells you the number of microstates for which A has energy E multiplied by omega prime E total e omega prime E prime. So this is like saying particles in the sub volume, particles outside the sub volume, the product of these probabilities. But it must be normalized, this whole thing must be normalized. So it must be normalized by omega total of E total. that is it, that is it because this is already factored. So what I should have put is a symbol omega subscript total such that A has energy E, A prime has energy, e, B has energy E prime and that quantity the numerator I factored into a property of A times property of B. So there is no square. So this is directly, it follows directly from the postulate of equal a priori probabilities, that is it. These functions are not known to me, I do not know this function and I do not know that function. In particular, and this is possible, if this huge system is a container of oil, an oil drum sitting inside an atmosphere of this kind, a bigger room, then this and that may have very different degrees of freedom altogether. So the function omega and the function omega prime may be very different functions, one describing the possible microstates of oil and the other describing possible microstates of air. I do not care, I still do not care at all. The only assumption is all the microstates of the total system are equally probable. Then it immediately follows that this is the probability. Okay. And our next task is to analyze this probability. We have to impose the condition of equilibrium. This is something we are going to do. So let me stop here today since some people have a test immediately after this and we will start from this point and see where we go. Is this convenient to stop or do we go on because I have no idea of what there is a, there's a quiz for people, there is a test so perhaps it is just as well we will stop here today. Okay. So this is my starting point. I believe there is a holiday coming up. Uh, we have a class on Wednesday next. Next Tuesday is a holiday, uh, next Wednesday we meet okay, and then we will dis discuss this, we will take it up from there. Okay.